Uh, yes, I'm not, uh, I don't have a baby and I'm not John uh, Steffel at all. Uh, I, I was asked by the organizers if I, could, if I could show his slides and I will show his slides and I've omitted a couple of slides that I didn't know, that I didn't understand at all and I've added uh, uh, two slides myself. Uh, so that is, uh, but, uh, uh, so, this is me. I'm professor uh, in in stroke uh, medicine, and I'm residing at Umeå Stroke Center and also Karolinska Institute Dandryd Hospital. And in this respect, I'm uh, steering uh, committee member of the Abbott SGM Stroke Close uh, study that we are planning to to start this uh, big randomized controlled trial of of uh, LAO versus best medical treatment in patients with. ICH uh, and atrial fibrillation, and I'm um, adjudicating uh, events in Amlet and the Portico uh, 1 uh, study. But now over to uh, John Steffel's uh, slides here, and these are quite old data, very, very old data, summarized by, uh, by Hart, uh, uh, 2007, that warfarin compared with, uh, with nothing uh, or placebo, uh, relative risk reduction of 64% and uh, uh, warfarin compared uh, antiplatelet uh, possesses a 22% risk reduction. Uh, and uh, some rather old data shows that, uh, that anticoagulants are quite heavily underused in patients with, uh, with atrial fibrillation. And at this moment, uh, it is a gradual change, but we don't know. But underuse, of course, but how, how much underuse it is, we don't really uh, know that. But, but old data shows that, uh, that uh, patients uh, with known AF admitted to acute stroke, uh, ischemic stroke, uh, that they would be, be either subtherapeutic, uh, uh, they would be single antiplatelet agents, dual antiplatelets, no antithrombotic. So, uh, more than half would be uh, without uh, at all effective treatment and and of the other um, uh, less than half uh, quite many of them would be subtherapeutic and patients with known af and previous ischemic stroke at, admitted to acute stroke is approximately the same uh, same situation here but those it's a study uh, published quite a long time ago and uh, yes uh, uh, pivotal uh, uh, the NOAC studies and overview, and it's the atrial fibrillation that John wanted to, to focus uh, on in, in his talk here. And uh, uh, yes, this meta-analysis published in Lancet 2013 is one of the, of the major, uh, this is a so well-cited uh, meta-analysis of the, of the pivotal uh, uh, AF, large AF, uh, uh, NOAC AF uh, trials. Rudai, Rocket AF, Aristotle and Engage. And the primary endpoint stroke, uh, systemic, um, uh, systemic embolism, showed a clear cut uh, benefit of NOAX. Uh, and, but uh, what drives this, uh, what, is the, what, is the, what is the major cause of this, uh, this event? And it's uh, in, in the, it is the, the, the major cause of the event because of stroke is either uh, ischemic or hemorrhagic, and the hemorrhagic stroke we've got a massive, massive uh, we've got a half uh, half uh, risk of of hemorrhagic stroke in the NOAC uh, treated patients compared with the with the warfarin treated patients. Intracranial uh, hemorrhage yes, but but the intracranial hemorrhage constitutes the majority of those of the inter intracerebral hemorrhage patients. So NOAC is quite effective preventing stroke, especially by preventing the the ischemic uh, the, the hemorrhagic strokes. But also there's a signal of all cause mortality uh, here. And John had a slide on on all cause mortality in this also, and and it's uh, quite much the same in the different trials uh, here uh, of a small uh, effect on uh, all cause mortality. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, yes. Uh, uh, you uh, see, stroke guidelines, uh, uh, AF guidelines from 2016. Uh, when uh, and and this was a new statement, so I think that is quite uh, quite uh, uh, quite important also to to 
to say because this uh, with with uh, with the data that were there and with real data when oral anticoagulation is initiated in patients with AF who is eligible for for uh, for NOAC uh, and NOAC is recommended in preference to vitamin K antagonists and this recommendation was changed uh, from the previous guidelines where uh, NOAX and warfarin had been uh, set equal and <coughs> And in this also, antiplatelet monotherapy is not recommended for stroke prevention in AF pa patients regarded of stroke risk. And this was also a new statement that this is a not to do thing. This is a harm thing to do. And, and even the, the, uh, the uh, low dose aspirin together with clopidogrel is not also, that is also, that is also incorporated. This is not an option in these guidelines that is, that is used before. And NOACs are not recommended in patients with mechanical heart valves, moderate to, to severe mit mitral stenosis, uh, and it was not mentioned here, but the, the very severe uh, kidney uh, uh, failure patients. Uh, I think that I will leave uh, this, because this is an old paper, a Danish registered paper, uh, with uh, with registered paper of, of patients with AF uh, and then uh, with newer NOAC data, but it shows that uh, per, uh, persons with uh, high Shadsvask and a high has bled, uh, they have they they have got uh, they have got favor of do having the 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 NOAC uh, drugs and also warfarin drugs. So so uh, to use uh, and I would. I uh, definitely agree with, with Professor Diener that, that, uh, uh, that there has bled, uh, not to summarize any score, but there are preventive factors that are included in this, in this has bled score. But these patients, uh, they benefit from, from anticoagulants, the ones that with high bleeding risk score and high uh, Shadsvask uh, uh, risk. Real-world analysis, and there's been published quite many, uh, quite much of real-world, and it will come more and more of the real-world uh, data here. But this is a uh, quite comprehensive uh, and one of the largest studies. I think this is one of the largest studies from America, and, and it's based on insurance data from Medicare, but, but also from uh, private insurance cases in, in the US. Uh, and what they did, uh, in this, uh, this is data from 2010 to 2015, and they've been looking at the effectiveness and safety of the NOAX versus warfarin in non valvular atri uh, atrial fibrillation, and they've done the propensity uh, score matching uh, of quite many variables, uh, like this. And when they do this, because they had done this before, but also, uh, but only with Dabigatron, uh, published in 2013 in circulation. But this is now for all NOACs. And this is quite small text, but uh, quite many patients, 339 uh, uh, patients, and on with AF, 166, 176,000 patients. But it ends up in propensity score matching of uh, Apixaban that has not been out in the market in the US for such a long time as Dabictron and Rivoxaban, uh, but 15, 28, and 32. Endoxaban is not here because that it had not been at the market not, in, not, not, in, not long enough in order to, to come into this analysis. And the, the data here uh, for Apixaban shows quite much the same as the randomized control hemorrhagic uh, intracranial. You've got to quite, uh, quite. Uh, you've got the signal there, especially uh, stroke systemic embolism. You've got also their favorable outcome here. And I would say that this, these are pooled data. So, so in America, it's, it is. Uh, this would be uh, both the high dose and the lower dose are pooled together uh, here. But then they do sensitivity analysis of the of the high and low doses. Uh, for for Dabigatron uh, in US, it's 150 and 75 milligrams, and then those are pooled in this. And also uh, note here that the hemorrhagic, uh, the intracranial hemorrhages, there you've got the, 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 the big signal here. Mm. Uh, and for Rivoxaban, also uh, hemorrhagic, intracranial, 
uh, you've got the signal there that it's that is a half uh, half approximate half risk of that. So uh, when doing uh, this kind of real world data, it has to be done. Uh, but then there are quite many questions: causation versus association, uh, association residual confounding. And I think that this, in this uh, study they've they've got quite large uh, patient material. And, but they're doing quite a good job with it. Selection bias, exclusion of important subgroups, uh, second, uh, yeah, secondary prevention, for example, in this different inclusion period, short follow-up. Sensitivity analysis regarding dosing. Uh, uh, they did that in this, but that, that could always be discussed. And propensity score matching is always under debate. But uh, the main message from this quite important study, the real-world data study here, is that, that uh, uh, real-world data are con quite consistent with the randomized cl clinical trials. And I could show quite many uh, more of those, but I think that this, this is uh, a good one. And <clears throat> it, yeah, the real data may and should not be used to answer questions that have not been uh, assessed in randomized clinical trials. Uh, but they should, but they should confirm and see, and one could pick up a little bit. I've got not now two own slides here, and 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 this is uh, how we. And this is secondary prevention, and this is from the Swedish uh, <clears throat> stroke registry, Rick Stroke here. And what we see here, and these are patients at discharge from the stroke units. The majority of patients, 92% of of stroke patients, are. Uh, treated in stroke units, so the, ma the vast majority are treated in stroke units. And here we could see uh, at discharge from the stroke unit, the patients with ischemic stroke and atrial fibrillation, the proportion that are treated with anticoagulants. And it used to be a quite low numbers, and especially the, one, uh, the men and women uh, above 80, but now we are up to 80 percent that are uh, uh, that are discharged uh, with. And, and oral anticoagulant at the, and no no difference in in uh, between sexes and patients uh, above 80 that is also uh, it's they are at the same level as the ones with uh, uh, under 80 that they were uh, some five years ago and also I should say here and the same this is for ischemic stroke, but it's the same figures for, for trans ischemic attacks. Uh, exactly the same figures there. And there's in, in Swedish real world clinical practice, there's a quite much of adjustment from year to year, more NOAX and less warfarin. So now uh, this is based on 2015, the last year 2015, and then it was 60 40, 60 uh, NOAX and 40% uh, uh, warfarin. But this is changing over time uh, quite dramatically. Another thing that is, that is quite much uh, uh, in, I think that this is relevant to this session because of, if we look, look because of ischemic stroke cases and TIA cases in Sweden, they go down. The the incidence of stroke uh, go down, and we see this uh, in the similar way as in myocardial infarction here. Uh, but the, the number of intracerebral hemorrhage patients, it is quite constant in, in Sweden, uh, a little bit less than 3,000 from year to year here. But then what we see here, th that the proportion of patients being on an oral anticoagulation when getting the intracerebral hemorrhage, that used to be less, that was under 80%, 8% in 2008, and now it's up to 20%. So it's more than doubled the proportion of patients uh, that has got an anticoagulant associated intracerebral hemorrhage. So 20%, 600 patients per year in Sweden, 1,500 patients per year in the Nordic countries. And I think that this is the uh, this is a target group that we are at, at this at this congress uh, and what we're discussing. What should we do with these patients? And it will be discussed quite much more in this session. Uh, now I come back to Jan's summary. Uh, NOAX standard therapy for stroke prevention. Uh, long, uh, yes, NOAX are standard therapy, and and uh, uh, of course, what we say in clinical practice that the patient uh, is the patient's choice, and the patient should uh, could cho choose between warfarin 
uh, and NOACs, but uh, and and that but the clinical practice now, I would guess, in Sweden as in, in Nordic countries and, and in Europe and and elsewhere, is that that the vast majority would prefer a NOAC uh, compared with a warfarin. Long-term registered data confirm and strengthen the results from large clinical trials. And, but then there are limitations remained of underuse. The underuse, we don't know about that in the primary prevention of high-risk uh, individuals of the Shreds VASC 2 and, uh, and above. Uh, interactions, we, we know that quite well, and I think that is quite well described in the European uh, atrial fibrillation guidelines. The, I think that the, it is meticulously described all the interactions of the NOACs together with, with both food and, and, the, and there isn't all, no, almost no interaction, but, but the drug interactions they're described in quite, <coughs> because of, it's much, much less than the warfarin, but they, there are important interactions. Special situations, severe re renal deficiency, uh, inappropriate use uh, of too low doses, uh, and I would guess this would be especially for the U.S. Uh, of, of dabigatron, but also pixabon, that, that one would uh, arbitrarily use the, the lower dose if a patient is uh, above uh, 80. Compliance and adherence, that seems to be working quite good. But then teaching, education is crucial. Careful in cross-comparison at different trials. Supplemental instead of mutual exclusive approach need, uh, approaches need to be assessed. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you.